great. I'm not used to being mic'd, so is this an appropriate level of volume for everyone? We're good. Um, so thanks, Steve, for that wonderful introduction, and thanks to everyone for the invitation to speak as part of this series. I'm really honored to be able to do this in my first semester at Penn. I just got here in July, um, and I'm incredibly honored to be speaking in such a beautiful space and with such an incredible number of people here um, who seem interested in this topic. So unlike the first speaker in this series, I'm here today to talk about a group of monuments that's not generally considered one of the great wonders of the world. Um, however, I'm hoping to make a case for them, or at least to draw your attention to the fact that we need not travel very far to witness the type of monumental grandeur that's often encapsulated in such lists. So the Mississippi River forms the fourth largest watershed in the world behind only the Nile, the Amazon, and the Yangtze and runs 2,400 miles from Minnesota, or from Minnesota all the way to Louisiana. While the Mississippi became known to Europeans in 1541 when Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto crossed it in search of gold, silver, and hopefully passage to China, it had at that time already been a center for resource procurement, travel, communication, and trade for well over 12,000 years. Today, the Mississippi River Valley is home to 300 species of birds, an additional 300 species of fish, 150 species of reptiles and amphibians, and undoubtedly innumerable invertebrates. Its rich floodplain soils have always provided the most fertile soil on the continent, and combined, these characteristics have made it an absolutely ideal place to live since human beings first entered North America. Today, the valley produces 92% of the nation's agricultural exports, and it is still home to a large population, including the major metropolitan areas like New Orleans, Memphis, St. Louis, Minneapolis, St. Paul. More than 50 cities, including well over 20 million people, rely on the Mississippi daily for their water, and 50 million tons of goods are shipped up and down the river for, per year. The central portion of the valley um, has been considered one of, the only, one of only seven independent centers of domestication in the world where sunflower, squash, and a variety of starchy and oily seed plants were domesticated in order to fill the growing prehistoric population inhabiting the area. Starting nearly 6,000 years ago, the people inhabiting the valley signaled, signaled its importance and its abundance by building earthen mounds along the Mississippi River banks. Between this beginning and the arrival of Europeans, thousands, if not tens of thousands of mounds were constructed in the Mississippi Valley. My work personally focuses in the lower portion of this valley, particularly in Mississippi and Louisiana, but today I'm gonna to focus more broadly on the monuments that were built throughout the entirety of the valley. When Europeans first entered what is now the United States and found the landscape dotted with impressive monumental constructions, they thought that there was absolutely no way the mounds could have been built by the people who they met currently inhabiting the landscape. Instead, they hypothes hypothesized that they must have been built by, and I'm just gonna give you a few examples, an ancient race of giants that no longer existed but were occasionally found buried in the mounds, Norse populations who left behind telltale rune stones in West Virginia, a wandering band of Hindus um, who left India behind in search of the New World, bringing their beautifully carved elephant pipes to Illinois with them, by one of the lost tribes of Israel who is said to have created this incredibly impressive map of the Great Lakes, or finally by the pyramid building Egyptians themselves who were nice enough to ca carve their entire pantheon into this rock in Vermont. So basically, in the minds of early European explorers, these options were all much more likely than believing that the indigenous people of North America could possibly have mastered such feats of engineering as you're gonna hear about today. So setting these various hypotheses aside, discovering the identity of the mound builders through locating, mapping, and excavating the mounds of the Mississippi Valley quickly became a focus of early American archeologists, and in particular, two landmark studies bear mentioning. The first is entitled a book, uh, or is a book entitled Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley, published in 1848 by Ephraim Squire and Edwin Davis as part of the nascent Smithsonian Institution. They immediately dismiss old world origins for the mounds. However, they suggest that they must either have been built by an ancient race of mound builders that no longer exists, or by the ancestors of the Mezzo and South American groups that, are already, that were already noted at that time for their exceptional engineering skills. Again, they left the native North Americans out of it. A few
few decades later, a man named Cyrus Thomas was hired to document every mound left in the United States and once and for all set the record straight regarding the populations who constructed them. The map on the left up here is based on a report by him published by the Bureau of American Ethnology in 1894. All of the red dots mark the locations of prehistoric mounds that were recorded and located by Thomas. So pretty impressive number. I'm not gonna try and make you learn about all of these today. These two reports came out of institutions based in Washington, D.C., but the scientific community that was thriving in Philadelphia in the mid-1800s also took interest. Around the same time that Squire and Davis were exploring the Mississippi Valley and mapping thousands of mounds, a man named Montrovel W. Dickinson, a physician with the Academy of Natural Sciences here in Philadelphia, took up an innovative and very research-oriented program of excavation within the American South. On numerous accounts, both Squire and Davis were not particularly shy about sharing their disdain for Dickinson stealing some of their glory, but he went about his, er, his work anyway, and unlike many of his contemporaries, he took detailed notes on his excavations, he published reports, he published articles, and he collected huge amounts of material from the mounds themselves. Much of this collection, both the artifacts and the documents, is now part of the Penn Museum's holdings right here in this building. After his fieldwork, Dickinson put much effort into popularizing American archaeology, and many believe that he has not received due credit for his formative role in the development of public interest in the discipline. These images represent the advertising pamphlets for two public lectures given by Dickinson between 1850 and 1852. As you can see, I've stolen my title, the title of my talk here tonight from the one on the left. Um, I'd like also to quote just one line from that pamphlet. It's right here. It's hard to read for you guys, so I'll read it. It says, Dr. D has devoted 12 years of his life in these investigations, having in that time explored the whole valley of the Mississippi, opened over 1,000 Indian monuments or mounds, and has a collection of 40,000 relics of those interesting but unhistoried Native Americans. Given that I have spent roughly the same amount of time in the field investigating mounds, I just did that math today and it's almost exactly the same, um, but I will admit I haven't dug in nearly as many, I'm hoping to live up to the second part of this quote um, and I will say the paragraph ends, his lecture abounds in val invaluable information and is worth alone double the price of admission, which at that time was a whopping 25 cents, so hopefully I can outdo him a little bit. Um, so I also have to admit that my debt to Dickinson is even greater than stealing his title. As far as I'm concerned, he pioneered the use of PowerPoint in archaeological lectures. <laughs> While he spoke, an absolutely incredible hand-painted panorama scrolled behind him, revealing scenes of his explorations and excavations. So before moving on to modern images and information about Mississippi Valley mounds, I thought I might show you just a little bit of Dickinson's panorama. Though at one time in the collection of the Penn Museum, the panorama now resides at the St. Louis Art Museum where it is actively being restored and will soon be put on permanent display. It's 348 feet long, seven and a half feet tall, and consists of 25 scenes that were hand painted by John Egan in the 1850s. Now, I don't have time today to show you all of these scenes, though I can tell you it makes for a really interesting lecture. Um, I picked out a few highlights. The images that were painted by Egan were based on sketches made in the field by Dickinson and his brother. They tend to focus on earthen monuments, but often also show native people inhabiting or utilizing the landscape surrounding the mounds. American archaeologists today have identified many of these sites as known named sites, making the collections that are housed here at Penn an essential resource for the scholars that are now excavating at these locations. Of particular interest to me is this painting of the Ferguson Group in Jefferson County, Mississippi. This particular panel represents the site on which I wrote my dissertation. And unlike most of the panels in this panorama, the Ferguson panel actually depicts Dickinson's excavations going on right here in the largest mound at the site. The Penn Museum still has many of the artifacts from these excavations, which I was able to make use of in my dissertation research along with Dickinson's documents. Um, and the pipe that's up there in the corner is actually on display in the Native American Voices exhibit right now, so you can go see it. Perhaps the most famous of the panels from this panorama is this one, depicting a bisected mound containing human burials and grave goods. It also shows the various layers of fill within the mound and thus represents one of the earliest depictions of archaeological stratigraphy that we have. 
Now, before moving on from Dickinson, I'm going to borrow just one more thing. Um, I was in class telling my students that I was going to do this, and they assured me that everyone who gives these lectures always manages to insert a little bit of humor. And I was a little worried about that. I wasn't exactly sure how I was going to do this until I realized that like visual aids, such as these, um, inserting humor into academic lectures is also an age-old practice and one that Dickinson did himself. So he actually had a, quote, humorous scene commissioned as one of the 25 panels of his panel which I'm sure took a lot more resources than me placing this slide into my PowerPoint today. Um, even though no transcripts were published of Dickinson's lectures, I do really wish that I knew um, what story he told while showing this one and how he related it back to mounds. Um, but I'm not even going to try. I just thought I would insert this as an attempt at the humor my students say is so necessary. So thanks to the work by these early pioneers and many others who researched the mounds in the early years of American archaeology, the fact that the ancestors of Native American groups living in the eastern United States at the point of European contact built the mounds finally came into general acceptance. With that acceptance, the focus of American archaeology turned to understanding when, why, and under what variety of circumstances the mounds were constructed. And I'm going to try and answer some of those questions for you tonight. So what I have up here now is a chart showing the construction and destruction dates for the traditional seven wonders of the world. As you can see at the top, the Great Pyramid at Giza, the topic of last month's talk, is clearly unique both in its antiquity and in the fact that it still dominates the Egyptian landscape today. Similarly, the monuments that we will be discussing this evening still dot the Mississippi Valley and were constructed at least 1,000, started being constructed at least 1,000 years before the Great Pyramid at Giza. What I will do for the rest of this talk is discuss just a small number of these sites marked with stars at the very top um, and focus on the six different Native American cultures who constructed them. During the rest of this lecture, we will move through time discussing some of the earliest, some of the most elaborate, and some of the largest earthen monuments in the United States. So we know confidently that mound construction in the United States had begun in the lower Mississippi Valley by around 3700 BC but it's possible that it started much earlier and we just don't have the radiocarbon dates yet to prove it. One of the earliest confidently dated sites is called Watson Break. It's located in northeast Louisiana. And Watson Break consists of 11 dome-shaped earthen mounds connected by a causeway and built around a central circular open space. And that's a depiction of it up there on the top left. The largest of these mounds is approximately 25 feet tall and I can say from experience that it towers over you and you stand close to it. The excavation of this and other early mound sites in the lower Mississippi Valley have shown that they were constructed by populations who lived in small, relatively mobile bands and relied solely on hunting, gathering, and fishing. So in other words, these monuments were constructed without intensive agriculture, without permanent settlements, and without strong political leadership that characterized most of the other monumental constructions that we hear about a lot, such as the Egyptian pyramids or the Mayan temples. So now we're going to jump forward in time nearly 2,000 years, but we're only going to move about 45 miles to the northeast of Watson Break and look at the site of Poverty Point. Until the discovery and radiocarbon dating of Watson Break and other sites in Louisiana, Poverty Point was thought to be the earliest monumental site in the United States, dating to around 1500 BC. One large mound, labeled Mound A up there on the map, four smaller associated mounds, all um, green rectangles up there, and six concentric earthen ridges surrounded an open central area. In 2014, Poverty Point was officially listed as a World Heritage Site, making it one of only four US prehistoric sites on that list, something we're very proud of, those of us that work down in the Lower Valley. Um, the large mound has been known for a very long time, of course. It's very easy to see on the landscape. But the true extent of Poverty Point was first recognized when this aerial photograph revealed the incredible ridge structure defining the central plaza. No one had ever noticed that these were here until they saw this photograph. Um, the outer ridge that you can see on there is about 3 quarters of a mile in diameter. And the site overall covers um, over 500 acres. Excavation in the ridges have revealed that Poverty Point people lived on top of them as they're filled with intact house floors, food remains, hearths, and innumerable small baked clay objects like these. Though very enigmatic at first, we now believe that these so-called Poverty Point objects, and I realize we weren't very creative in our name, 
were used as boiling stones during the cooking process in an area where stone was relatively hard to come by. The large mound at Poverty Point has likewise attracted a great deal of archaeological attention. Since early in its history, it has been described as a bird-shaped mound, and it consists of a tall area attached via a ramp to a larger, lower platform. It's the second largest earthen construction in the Americas, and it stands over 75, 70 feet tall, covers an area equivalent to about eight football fields, and contains 17,000 dump trucks worth of fill, just to give you an idea of how big this thing is. Um, I wish I had a picture with people standing in it. The people would be barely visible on the top up there. Recent excavations into this mound have shown that the entire thing was built very quickly, likely in a matter of days. This rapid construction would have required, of course, a huge number of people putting forth a massive amount of communal labor. So what was Poverty Point? We have evidence of structures, but not nearly enough of them to house the population necessary to build this huge of a mound. Moreover, there's still no evidence of agriculture or political leadership. The clues to answering these questions lay in the material culture of the site itself, and here are a few examples. The collections from Poverty Point contain some of the most beautiful and exquisitely made stone artifacts in America, and here are a few examples of um, jas jasper and greenstone beads, and then over closer to me is a hematite plummet or a net weight. Not only does the skill necessary to create such objects suggest the presence of specialized artisans, but the raw materials present at the site suggest an incredible amount of long distance trade, bringing these um, stone materials into Poverty Point. The Poverty Point Exchange Network spanned from the Rocky Mountains to the Appalachians and from the Great Lakes to the Gulf Coast, and it focused largely on high quality stone material. Based on this understanding, the site of Poverty Point is now thought of as a trade and craft production center. Though a small number of artisans may have lived more or less permanently on those ridges, people living around the various non-mound sites scattered all across the lower Mississippi Valley would likely have gathered periodically at Poverty Point to take part in this trade network and also to build the mounds, while of course conducting more mundane but necessary social activities such as arranging marriages, reinforcing kin ties, and forging alliances with other groups. Over time, these gatherings would imbue the place with social and perhaps even supernatural power, making the occasional pilgrimage back even more important. So this type of large-scale communal aggregation does not appear again in North American prehistory until around the year AD 1, when something called the Hopewell Interaction Sphere develops. Centered in Ohio, this trade network spanned over 2,000 miles and supplied raw material for some of the most spectacular artifacts in North American prehistory, including these elaborately incised ceramic vessels, beautiful stone tools, incredibly detailed carved stone pipes. The one on the left up there actually has bone teeth and pearl eyes. Dramatic mica cutouts and embossed copper decorative pieces. So though the mounds at Hopewell sites themselves look fairly similar to the small dome-shaped mounds found at earlier sites, they were used in a very different way. Unlike the other sites that we've discussed so far, Watson Break and Poverty Point, the incredible artifacts that I just showed you are primarily found with burials that were carefully placed inside Hopewell mounds. Most mounds contained numerous individuals. Um, you can see sort of a diorama of one of these mounds here. Um, and some graves were much richer than others, perhaps indicating that people either earned differential status during their lifetimes or served different social roles that were worth respecting through death. Hopewell mounds exist in association with incredibly complex geometric earthworks. And here are a few pictures of those. The earthen embankments that make up these elaborate designs range from five to eight feet in height, and the picture up here in the corner closest to me is showing me standing on top of one of these um, earthen embankments. And of course, as you can see, they're impressive from the ground, but it's difficult to ascertain their patterning. From the air, however, that you can easily see that the earthworks are in regular geometric shapes, including octagons, rectangles, squares, circles, and what in American archaeology we have begun to affectionately call squircles, falls somewhere between a square and a circle. We weren't sure what to call it. 
These images in particular that are up here right now are parts of the, are parts of the Newark earthworks in Heath County, Ohio, and I've chosen to show you this site particularly because the earthworks themselves are incredibly well preserved, um, and that is because they are on a modern golf course. Not the typical way of preserving an archaeological site, but it's worked wonders for Newark. Um, that said, only a small portion of the site is this well protected. Only a small portion is on the golf car course. The site was, in fact, much larger, as indicated on this map drawn by Squire and Davis in the 1840s. Um, you saw the octagon up there in the top left corner and this circle down here. Um, the rest of the site has been largely destroyed. This image shows an elaborate layout, including a variety of large earthen embankments, um, as well as small circular monuments. Um, which are the teeny circles surrounding it, small conical burial mounds, which are the ones drawn with just little hash marks instead of solid lines, um, and these long, narrow causeways, the longest of which um, runs through the middle of the site there and is over two and a half miles long. So again, we can ask the question, what were these sites and how did they function within Hopewell society? In answering this, it's necessary to take a slightly broader look. So we're gonna zoom out here. Um, and look at the Scioto River Valley in general. Um, the town that's drawn up there is the modern town of Chillicothe, Ohio, um, and Newark is visible um, on the far side of the river closest to me. Within the Scioto River Valley in southern Ohio, Squire and Davis mapped approximately 20 large earthwork complexes, and they hypothesized that at the time that they were mapping, many more had already been destroyed. They further hypothesized that many of these sites may have been linked by long causeways like those found at Newark, but that agricultural activity in the area would have quickly erased them from the landscape entirely. This incredible concentration of elaborate mound sites connected by monumental causeways suggests that the Scioto River Valley was a location of great ritual significance to Hopewell people, and the incredible number of ceremonial objects associated with these sites supports this conclusion. And here, again, are a few examples. In particular, certain objects that were placed with burials suggest that the individuals interred at these sites were afforded special treatment and death due to their social role in life. So certain, certain objects, such as this carved human figure wearing a bear skin up at the top, or these two copper headdresses that are down at the bottom, suggest that individuals played a shamanic role in society. Shamanic individuals would have been people thought to have the ability to communicate with animals and to mediate between the upper and lower worlds, or the human and the spirit worlds that existed beneath and below them, beneath and above them. As such important ritual figures, shamans were deserving of great respect, and that is shown through their elaborate burial at these Ohio Hopewell earthworks. So around AD 500, the construction of elaborate geometric earthworks, the wide trade network, and the elaborate burials that characterized Hopewell society ceased. We believe that this moment reflects a change in the social organization of people living in and around the Mississippi Valley. These are just a couple images of the shamans that these people might have recognized. These changes would have been closely related to shifts in population size, technological innovations such as the development of the bow and arrow, and increasing importance of agricultural subsistence as well as changes in intergroup relationships. But despite all these hypotheses, precisely what happened to end Hopewell society and why are questions that are still hotly debated within American archaeology. Because of this so-called collapse, the period that followed Hopewell has long been ignored, being set aside as a, quote, slightly murky interval between two great cultural fluorescences. However, in my opinion, incredibly interesting mound-building cultures flourished during this interval, and I would like to talk about just one of them today. So for this, we're going to look further north in the Mississippi Valley to the area encompassed by southern Wisconsin and neighboring areas in Illinois, Iowa, and Minnesota. This region was home to a population that built huge numbers of mounds from approximately AD 600 to AD 1000. And though conical mounds continue to be built in large numbers, many of the mounds constructed during this time were effigies. They were, animal, they were built in, the, in a variety of animal shapes, including but certainly not limited to birds, bears, panthers, lizards, turtles, and human beings. Many of the same creatures that played important roles in the symbolism of Hopewell people, the same creatures that you saw symbolized in those Hopewell artifacts, 
um, obviously played important roles in these people's lives as well as they were being made out of earth rather than out of stone or shell or ceramic. We've been able to estimate that there were over 20,000 mounds constructed in this region during the effigy mound time period, and about 4,000 of them still exist today in small parks across the northern Midwest. I went to undergraduate school in southern Wisconsin, and we actually had a turtle effigy mound on my campus. The largest of these remaining effigy mounds is near Muskoda, Wisconsin, and it represents a bird with a wingspan over a quarter mile in length, just to give you an idea of the scale. A great number of these mounds are now preserved at Effigy Mounds National Monument in Iowa. Um, overall, the park preserves 206 mounds in a few large clusters. The largest cluster includes at least 116 mounds along the banks of the Mississippi River and represents the largest group of mounds in one location in all of North America. And that's what's being depicted in the bottom picture here. Um, the mounds in both of the top and the bottom pictures are outlined in white just to make them easier to see from the air. The second largest cluster, commonly referred to as the Marching Bears, and you can probably see why, was constructed along a ridge high above the river. Though effigy mounds themselves are generally only a few feet in height, you can see from the person standing next to the ones in the center image. Um, their view from the air and the sheer numbers of them makes them incredibly stunning. Moreover, though signified differently, these mounds seem to represent a continuation of the belief system that was clearly identifiable in the preceding Hopewell culture, suggesting a deep relationship with the spirit world for effigy mound builders as well. In this case, we believe that it's likely that these mounds were arranged in clusters emphasizing a certain animal, representing perhaps clan totems, and maybe having been built to honor that creature and or lay claim to a particular territory. Though not nearly as beautiful or as elaborate as Hopewell artifacts, pottery, stone tools, and food remains have been found alongside these effigy mounds, and they indicate that people congregated near them to hold ceremonies that involved building the mounds and burying the dead. As is always true, these events would also have provided the opportunity to celebrate kinship bonds, to establish cooperative relationships with members of other groups, and to create wider social cohesion. Around the same time as the effigy mounds were being built in the upper Mississippi Valley, a new form of monumental construction was becoming popular in the central and lower valleys. In general, around 8700, we see a shift in the lower valley from the construction of relatively small, round-topped mounds used for burial of the dead to much larger, flat-topped platform mounds primarily used as foundations for structures. These platform mounds were not randomly arranged, but were often carefully laid out in rectangular groups with central open plazas between them. So they go from being conical mounds randomly arranged to being platform mounds arranged in very specific ways. This shift in mound form and arrangement takes place alongside parallel shifts from a primarily hunting and gathering lifestyle to subsistence based largely on corn agriculture and from a largely egalitarian to a highly hierarchical political system. Though many of these late prehistoric platform mound sites have been excavated throughout the Mississippi River Valley, I'm gonna focus on a single example that epitomizes these three trends. The Cahokia Mound site is located in Illinois, just across the Mississippi River from the modern city of St. Louis. It's set amid the largest prehistoric concentration of people and monumental architecture north of Mexico. Though estimates vary wildly depending on who you ask, the city of Cahokia and its outlying settlements may have been home to as many as 50,000 people and would have taken more than a day to traverse on foot or close to a, a day to traverse by canoe. Cahokia's record as the most densely populated city in America would have held up until the early 1800s when the burgeoning city of New York would have finally come around to surpassing it. Cahokia itself contained at least 120 mounds and nearby sites now under the cities of St. Louis and East St. Louis would have contained at least 60 more. So I'm now gonna give you a little tour of the ceremonial core of Cahokia and tell you just a bit about what we've learned from excavating at the site. The ceremonial core of Cahokia spans about five square miles and today contains 80 mounds, though undoubtedly it originally included many more that are no longer standing. 
Part of what is protected today is the Cahokia Mounds World Heritage Site. This is one of the other four, one of the four um, that is a US prehistoric site on that list. Consists of a typical platform mound and plaza layout with 16 mounds surrounding a 46 acre plaza. This entire space was then enclosed within a sizable palisade wall that served to protect the city's central precinct from outside attacks. This wooden palisade is over two miles long and it would have required 15,000 logs, probably 12 to 15 feet in height to construct. More mounds, numerous secondary plazas, and other functional and ceremonial features sit outside of this central plaza area. Now we obviously don't have time tonight to examine all of these features, but I do want to tell you about a few of them. So first off, the largest mound at Cahokia, um, which is known as Monk's Mound, named after a Trappist monastery that was built on the mound in historic times, dominates the central precinct from its position at the north end of the plaza. It's the largest earthen construction in the Americas. It's 100 feet tall and consists of five separate terraces and was constructed starting around AD 1000. In its final stage, the upper terrace of Monk's Mound would have supported a building that was probably around 100 by 50 feet in dimension and perhaps as much as 50 feet tall, adding to the height of the mound. The base of the mound covers roughly the area of 14 football fields, um, and it would have required over 6 million baskets of dirt to be dug up using stone hoes and wooden tools put into baskets and then hauled by hand, not by pack animals, to the top of this mound. To compare it to the more regularly discussed monuments, Monk's Mound is not nearly as tall, but is much larger at the base than both the Great Pyramid at Giza and the Temple of the Sun at Teotihuacan. While the height of these other monuments is certainly impressive, and I'll give them that, it's important to remember that Monk's Mound was built entirely of earth and thus didn't rely on the well-stacking properties of stone blocks. Moreover, labor estimates created for the Great Pyramid suggests that over 70% of the time, the energy and the materials went into building the bottom third, while it took only the remaining 30% of effort and resources to complete the construction to the top. So in addition to the huge amount of labor that would have gone into constructing Monk's Mound, the effort put into constructing the other features at the site would also have been massive. For example, the twin mounds, which are up here at the top, sit at the opposite end of the plaza from Monk's Mound and are both at least 45 feet tall. Moreover, the plaza itself, pictured there in the center, would have been an incredibly laborious creation. It encompasses the area of about 35 football fields, and it represents the largest public space conceived of and executed north of Mexico in prehistoric times. It was artificially flattened, which means it also would have required a huge amount of labor. Nearby to this grand plaza, um, Cahokians also constructed a giant solar calendar, which is what's pictured here on the bottom, that was rebuilt four times using massive cedar posts during the primary occupation of Cahokia. This monument records the summer and winter solstices, the equinox, and likely also marked important festival dates related to the agricultural cycle. In short, it functioned a lot like Stonehenge, but it was made out of wood. Thanks to a long history of excavation at Cahokia, we know a great deal about the lives of the people who lived in the Mississippi Valley from around AD 1000 to AD 1400. In addition to the mounds that remain conspicuous on the Cahokian landscape today, excavations have uncovered the remains of many houses neatly arranged in neighborhoods along paths or streets. It would have been a busy and a bustling city where people made and used tools, maintained fields of corn and other crops, exchanged, go exchanged goods and ideas, prepared, consumed food, played games, raised children, nursed the sick, buried the dead. I think you probably get the idea. All the things that we do today. Likewise, they would have also struggled with many of the same issues that plague our urban environments today. They dealt with overcrowding, with trash accumulation, with violence, and with crime. And yet, for hundreds of years, they thrived in this place. Their fields provided such an abundance of corn that they had much more than they could eat. This surplus fueled their society, providing goods for trade and exchange, allowing some Cahokians to dedicate their time to becoming skilled artisans and craft specialists, 
and allowing others to rise to positions of leadership. Cahokia's chief lived on the highest point at the site atop Monk's Mound, and from there he ruled his incredible city and maintained order and harmony among his people. Similarly to the individuals buried in Hopewell Mounds, it's also likely that this chief was charged with maintaining the balance between the upper world and the lower world for communicating with the spirits and for ensuring the survival of the entire Cahokia population. Though we will not discuss them today, a number of other large mound sites date to roughly the same time period as Cahokia and were also ruled by such powerful chiefs. These include Etowah in Georgia, Moundville in Alabama, and Spiro in Oklahoma. And I should point out that all of these sites, along with many of the other ones that I've mentioned today, are open to the public, and I encourage you to visit them. They're even more incredible when you're there. Um, each of these sites has a really inc incredible story um, that's more fascinating than the last. So as you go through them, you'll learn um, so much more if you went through them one by one. Excavation of these late prehistoric mounds also helps to deepen our understanding of the current Native American worldview and the variety of belief systems that are alive and well today in today's tribes. The beautiful and deeply meaningful art created by these people in these communities provides a window into how prehistoric Native American groups understood their world, both the seen and the unseen aspects. And I'm not gonna explain all of the artifacts that are up here today, but you can suffice it to say that most of these things relate to a very um, now well understood idea of how the prehistoric people in the Americas viewed their world. And um, hopefully someday I can come back and, and talk more about that. So at the beginning of my talk, I showed this diagram. And I've now told you about the earliest mounds, like those at Watson Break and Poverty Point. I've told you about some of the most ornate examples, like those created by the Hopewell and Effigy Mound building cultures. And then some of the largest constructions, like those at Cahokia. But I would like to end by pointing out something that also differentiates these mounds from even the pyramids at Egypt. And that is that mound construction still actively occurs in the native communities with whom we share the continent. I was lucky enough to attend a mound building ceremony hosted by the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians in the mountains of North Carolina while I was in graduate school there. The mound, which is currently about 50 meters in diameter and only at this point about one and a half meters tall, at one time would have been a rather prominent landscape feature. It's been plowed almost to oblivion at this point. Known as Gadua, the Cherokee believe this ancient settlement is the birthplace of their people. After centuries of disease, of warfare, and of exploitation brought on by European contact, Gadua was sold at auction in 1821. Most Cherokee people were then forcibly removed from their land soon thereafter. Those who escaped removal were left in the state of North Carolina with no legal right to hold property. It was not until 1996 that the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians had the opportunity to buy back the land on which Gadua stood. On June 24, 2011, when I was there, 173 years after being forced from their land forcibly, Cherokee people undertook their 10th consecutive year of mound building at the site. Mound construction has thus continued with only minor interruptions for nearly 6,000 years in the United States. These mounds represent some of the earliest monumental constructions in the world. Their size and their elaboration rivals even the most famous monuments from other region, regions. And it is for this reason that I wholeheartedly believe that the mounds of the Mississippi Valley could rightfully hold a place on any list of great wonders of the world. Thank you. <laughs>